Hello, my name is Maria Cox and on behalf of California State Parks I want to thank you for coming and uh, sharing a video tour with me today. I've been a guide here at the castle for about eight years and I thought we might get a chance to look at a closer uh, look at one of the textile collections of Mr. Hurst's here. Uh, what we are often asked when we have a start of upstairs suites tour here in the Doge suite is, what are those things hanging on the wall? The simple answer, uh, they're chasubles. Uh, but what are those? Well, uh, they're religious vestments. These are garments that were worn by priests and during the different services, particularly those faiths that practice the Eucharist or communion. They actually go back further in history. They're based off of garments from ancient Rome called casulas. And these were actually garments worn by Romans traveling during the winter. And they would have long sleeve things. Over the centuries, these sleeves have gone away. Here in the Doge suite, we have a pair of 18th century French silk uh, chasubles. Uh, they're on the, uh, what they call a faille fabric made of silk, and they have silk embroidery on them. One thing you'll notice, though, is that their colors have faded. Well, UV light is very damaging to textiles. What will happen is colors will fade as the fabrics, the threads, will turn brittle and often break. So here at the castle, we've taken measures to try and protect our collection a little bit more. Firstly, we tend to close the blinds during the brighter parts of the day to limit the amount of light exposure coming into the rooms. And we've also put UV filters on those windows to keep the UV light out, which does the most damage. Now, there's a simple little experiment you can do to prove to yourself just how damaging these rays can be. We all know here during the summer you're not wearing those black socks. So take a pair out of that sock drawer, take one of those socks, tape them up into any window in your house, doesn't have to be any particular directional window, and then stick the other one back in your drawer. At the end of the summer, take them out and do a little comparison. And you'll see what just two months of daily exposure to light can do to a textile. So you might be asking, why would Mr. Hurst kept, collect religious uh, garments? Well, according to our museum director, Mary Ledkoff, uh, collecting of religious vestments and using them as uh, wall decorations was uh, a sign of more opulence than paintings. And Mr. Hurst will definitely use them to the effect here in his Gothic sitting room, where we have two 15th and two 16th century Spanish um, chasubles. Now, what makes them so opulent will be their opries, the embroidered band that goes down the back. And we can get a closer look at one in more detail as we make our way over to Mr. Hurst's bedroom. So here, and we have a great look at an embroidered ofri. Now, ofris were started to be used on chasubles beginning in the 8th century, and they would get more elaborate as time would go on. They used incredible detail in their embroidery. Often, they would be done on gold fabric and using gold and metallic, uh, silver metallic threads. Now, those threads are rather special in that the way they were made. Uh, strands of silk would have wrapped around them uh, sheets of either gold or silver that were kind of pounded out to a thinness of about the thickness of a hair. And this made them unique because uh, then they couldn't be used to, to actually be sewn and they needed to be placed on top of the pieces. In a method known as couching, they would be attached using a silk thread that matched the color of the embroidery. Here is a 15th century Italian chasuble that we have mounted behind glass to protect it. And what makes it even more unique is the surface that it's on. It's on a voided blue velvet. Now what voided means is that they've removed the nap or some of the fabric off of the base. And it, what it did, it created this unique floral pattern. 
So when we talk about the making of chasubles, it's important to look about who was making them. And as you might expect, it was women. These women would also be in charge of the workshops and, or with their families as far as how these crafts would be produced. These workshops set up special rules on to how they would be created, one of them being that they could only do the embroidery during natural lighting, which means they had to have sunlight in order to work. So imagine how much more could get accomplished in the summer versus the winter. All right. Now it would take a team of four women, um, in about 1271, uh, three and three quarters years to complete an altar frontal. Now, for that altar frontal, they were paid 270 pounds in 1271. What's the equivalent today? Well, in 2017, the equivalent would be 160,500 pounds. Uh, now, we can imagine what we could get with that today, but what could they get with 270 pounds in 1271 England? Well, they could get in the neighborhood of 200 head of horses, or maybe up to 600 head of cattle to help with the village. So they were paid quite well for the craftsmanship that they did. When they did the embroidery, I've mentioned a couple of times how they did it on the fabric. The embroidery actually wasn't sewn directly onto the fabric, but done separately. Because of those metallic threads, it's not something you could very easily clean. So they would remove the embroidered pieces off the base, those ovaries were the ones that they would remove, then the textile itself could be cleaned, and then the pieces would be reattached onto the base. Well, it's been a pleasure to show you a few of what actually are my favorite items here in our collection. Uh, Mr. Hurst did have a wealth of textiles, and if you are interested in seeing more of these chasubles, uh, they can all be seen on our Upstairs Suites tour. And we hope to have you uh, come and join us soon.